Welcome to the Let's Talk series of Tech in the Arts, the podcast for the Arts Management and Technology Lab. My name is Angela Johnson, the podcast producer. And I'm B. Crittenden, the Technology and Interactive Content Manager. Each month, we review trending stories and discussions with topics such as streaming, artificial intelligence, marketing, social media, inclusion, fundraising, and much more. Our goal is to exchange ideas, bring awareness, and stay on top of the trends. In this month's episode, we will discuss the recent Golden Globe nominations, streaming possibilities for arts organizations, and different ways that museums are connecting with their audiences virtually during COVID-19. Hi, Angela. How's it going? Good. I'm excited for our topics today. Yeah. So to start off, the Golden Globe nominations were announced on February 3rd, and um, there are some really interesting implications of these nominees. Um, So for starters, streaming has wiped the floor with all network television. Network television is dead. (laughs) Um, It's bleak. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> but not even just Netflix. We're talking Hulu, we're talking Amazon Prime. In terms of acting and writing, directing, we have The Great, we have Rami, Emily in Paris, The Crown, even slightly less acclaimed programming like Hunters. Almost everything that is considered like... Like trendy? Yeah, like trendy. Everything that everyone's watching, everything that everyone cares about. Is talking about. Is talking about, Yeah. <laughs> is um is in streaming and i think that's really interesting especially since in the past that this is probably one of the first years when it's really like overpowering and a lot of that obviously has to do with covid and just everyone's home and so it's not like you're gonna go see movies in theaters for the most part so i don't know i know a lot of the good movies that i saw were on netflix but one thing that i do think is interesting and we should probably be talking about is also the critically acclaimed TV shows and movies that aren't getting nominations. For instance, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Chadwick Boseman, and Viola Davis got nominated. And obviously, they were going to nominate Chadwick after he uh, passed. And Viola Davis, every, everyone loves Viola Davis. It is a crime not to nominate Viola Davis. I don't care what she does. But, <laughs> but the movie doesn't get nominated. As well as uh, Spike Lee's new film, The Five Bloods, didn't get nominated for anything. As well as Michaela Cole's show, I I May Destroy You, which was amazing. Everyone agrees. And Steve McQueen's um, miniseries, Small Acts, the only nomination was uh, John Boyega, who was already super famous and was only in one episode. But there were five episodes and it was critically acclaimed. It's amazing. And his was honestly not, it was a good episode, but it wasn't the best episode. (laughs) Hot take. (laughs) Yeah. But my point is that like all of these shows and movies that have like primarily black cast and black people behind the scenes are not really getting nominated for anything. I think that like the only black director who got nominated was Regina King and she was amazing. And One Night in Miami is amazing. But I think that is pretty indicative of something. I did see, I think the one I've seen the most backlash on was I Might Destroy You. Um, And that could just be of the, like the platforms that I have seen the discourse on, mostly Twitter. But even I saw people involved in, with Emily in Paris were like, um, we did not deserve this nomination and I might destroy you <laughs> definitely deserved all of the nominations. Yeah, like I think Emily in Paris is, I haven't seen it, but from what I can tell, it's perfectly decent, like trashy television. I don't mean that derogatorily, like, yeah, it's a, it's a, this is fun and nothing and that's fine. But I made a story that was like intense and significant and it's, it's just really well done. So uh, Viola Davis is nominated for Best Actress, but also nominated is uh, Andra Day for The United States versus Billie Holiday, which, you know, there's a whole other conversation to be had about Black people playing historical figures and that's the only thing that gets nominated. But that's not what we're talking about right mm. now. Um, but also, hey, streaming is considered like a legitimate form of television. And, um, like I know for a long time at the Oscars, movies that were streamed had to have like really tiny theater releases just so that they could be nominated. And I think we're kind of moving past that in a big way. 
Yeah. And I, I think the pandemic probably helped with that a little bit, but we were also already moving in that direction. I think it's really indicative of the successful transition from streaming as a form of distribution and streaming companies really embracing the production side of it and how valuable that could be. And now it's just the norm. I was thinking about how several years ago, one of the first times Amy Poehler and Tina Fey hosted the Golden Globes, they made a joke that was like, you know, Netflix was nominated for a few awards that particular night. And one of them made a joke about how next year Netflix won't be laughing when Snapchat comes up to accept an award. And at the time it was obviously a joke, but now it's like, no, we're not seeing Snapchat in contention for any <laughs> Golden Globes awards, but it's also like, it's not, it doesn't hit as hard because now this is just, this is just the way things are. Yeah, this is just how we consume media. And like, it probably wouldn't be Snapchat, but you know, TikTok, hey. <laughs> they made a musical, what can't they do? Yeah, it's, it's, it's indicative of how people are consuming things, but then also how media companies are, are creating content. I mean, they're actually creating content. And I, it is worth noting that Netflix still takes the cake in terms of their nominations. I think they had 42 nominations and the second sort of runner up was Hulu with, I think it was around 12. It's in the low teens. So Netflix is really still dominating in terms of the recognition they're getting for what they're producing, but it's also the most popular streaming platform. Yeah. And a lot of that is just because they were there first. Like they've just been doing this the longest. They've been creating original content the longest. So it makes sense that they're the ones dominating at the moment, but we'll just have to see. I mean, I don't necessarily see a future where Amazon prime has <laughs> the most nominations, but you know, Hulu is catching up. It's funny too, because there are so many now. Last night was the Super Bowl for context. And it seems like they continue to announce new streaming platforms. Paramount Plus, I know there's a Discovery Plus. Anything that was once a cable channel is now becoming a, a, its own streaming service. Yeah, like NBC is Peacock. And it's like channels are transitioning to streaming because if they don't, they're just going to not well i mean i don't know it's that thing where like it was nice when they were just putting their shows on already existent streaming services it was nice you don't have to buy every single streaming platform you can just subscribe to one or two and it's definitely more convenient for consumers um and i understand why networks are starting to have their own but i feel like that's ultimately only going to make things worse for everyone because a lot of people aren't going to sign up because they're like i don't want seven streaming services. I really wanted three or two. But moving on from television and movies, uh, streaming is going into lots of different areas. And um, B, you've been an Amped Lab contributor the last few months, and um, you've been talking about this. Yeah, so what I've been looking into is streaming and how people are streaming and streaming platforms, specifically in the performing arts industry which was worthy of conversation a year ago, but since the pandemic hit, it's become even more relevant for arts organizations who have really been, for the most part, forced to share their performances online in the digital landscape. And many organizations have never done this before and are just kind of experimenting and playing around with not only how to create the content for digital consumption, what tools to use, to present it, but then also how to monetize it if it's something that they're looking to actually create some revenue, which as we know right now is really essential for a lot of organizations who have few revenue streams with everything shut down. So this is sort of a follow-up to our first Let's Talk where we started talking about streaming. We mentioned a few different services and how we talked about kind of a preliminary overview of streaming performing arts then and this is going a little deeper I really became interested in looking at how these aggregate streaming platforms which is like a third-party company that is consolidating content from a variety of different producers onto their platform and how this can be used in the arts and 
these companies do exist. There are several platforms out there. There are several platforms over the last decade who have popped up with either free content or um, ones that are subscription-based. Some are now defunct. And then there are a few more actually in the European context that have been around for quite a while. One is called Medici TV, which presents mostly classical music, but they've sort of broadened their reach to provide both opera, ballet, they provide master classes. So they're diversifying their catalog a little bit. And then there, there's also digital theater, which consolidates theater <laughs> onto their platform from, from the UK. In the US, there's I did sort of a, a case study on Marquee TV. And I also looked at a smaller one that that presents more sort of contemporary performances, which is called On the Boards TV. So I really looked at those and looked at what other organizations who are not distributing their content on these consolidated platforms and instead opting to create their own individual streaming platforms for their own content. So what most of them are doing is either just embedding a video on their website or adding a link to their website for either a Vimeo or a YouTube link, or they're actually building out um, a platform on their website that people can purchase a subscription to that allows them to view their content on demand. So what I really have been thinking about is for arts organizations, what is the viability and the value of trying to get their content on an aggregated streaming platform versus making their own? Yeah, no, I think this is really cool. And I think it's really interesting conversation, especially you know, because of COVID and everything. And we obviously want the arts to be able to continue even if it's in an online setting. But even beyond that, I think what COVID has brought up is a lot of issues of like accessibility and like the availability of um, the arts, even if you're not like, you can't be in that physical location and just having it be more than just the recording of the live performance. Like it doesn't have to be a worse experience just because it's online. It's like we were just talking about with uh, having more and more streaming services versus everything just being all in one place. And I think we kind of established how we feel about that. But uh, it's also the question of what's best for the organization. Yeah. So kind of going off of that, one of the biggest values that trying to get your content on an aggregated streaming platform is the ability to expand your audience. Uh, And that happens in a couple of ways. One is a lot of these companies, I know that Marquee TV does this, they actually provide their partner organizations with audience data. In the US, this includes data that allows the partner organization, so the arts organization, to build out their mailing lists, reach those new audiences with their marketing efforts. If, you know, someone at home is scrolling through their recommended content on Marquee TV, they stumble upon something they like there, you've potentially gained a new audience member. So that that's a big one. I, I know that a lot of people would probably make the argument that these single entity streaming services, so an, an organization has their own streaming platform on their own website, that that allows them to expand their audience as well. And it does because I can choose to watch a West Coast based symphonies content. So they're, you know, I'm not bound by geography. I can do it from, from where I am. But now that all of these organizations are creating their own, there's so much competition in the digital, like you said, there's so much competition that it makes it really hard to actually attract viewers because there there are just so many options now. Whereas an aggregate platform, first of all, a subscriber has unlimited access to it, to all the content, and um, it's kind of put right in front of them. the The platforms are typically well curated, and they do have algorithms that present content to viewers that they would be interested in. So, it's it creates more of like a a through line. And encourages new audiences to consume your content easily. Things that they might already have an interest in. Things that they can do 
on an unlimited basis. So that's a really big one. Another big thing to think about here is what kind of revenue different methods of streaming your content are going to create. And it's likely that if you have your own streaming platform, that's all to yourself, you're going to make more per ticket sold or per subscription. Just because the fees to do it yourself and the tools will likely be less than the money you're making from partnering with an aggregate streaming platform, which they usually operate, they create their partnerships with organizations, either they're sharing revenue or they're paying a, an usually annual licensing fee to get a license to share your work. So you're not getting as much per stream or per um, subscription fee, but it is arguably a strong, like long-term option. If you're looking to, to distribute your content long-term beyond the pandemic, as opposed to this being sort of a temporary solution during the pandemic and wanting to, to make as much revenue per ticket sales possible. That's another thing for arts organizations to think about. And then another final thing for organizations to think about is their capacity to to even manage a streaming platform. A lot of smaller organizations um, might have to hire someone to create the platform for them if they don't have that talent in-house. Um, so that's another expense of doing that. And if you really want to build a streaming platform that is heavily branded and contributes to sort of your, your online presence, then it could be a good option because with when you're distributing on a aggregated service, you don't have much creative control over that, you know, but that's another thing to weigh. It's, it's not like one option is better than the other, but it's more about how these different elements align with the organization's goals is it a long-term solution? Is it just sort of a temporary solution until we can be live again? Is it, do you have the capacity? Do you want this branded channel or not? And then do you, do you want to expand your audience or do you just want to work on maintaining your current audience and engaging with them as much as you can? I appreciate that like there, are, I mean, you just said this, but I really appreciate that there's not really one option that is better than the other. Like if you're trying to grow, maybe having, being on like an aggregate, is better and like if you don't want to have to build out like a whole thing that makes sense but also if you do want like it's not a bad thing to want to have your own like place where you're streaming just your content that makes sense in a lot of cases but it's not necessarily the right choice for everyone well and i think another thing to keep in mind is that even if an organization desperately wants to be included on an aggregate platform, they might not necessarily get the opportunity to because there aren't there there really aren't a lot of options in the you know niche for performing arts streaming platform landscape in, in the US mm. at least. And they are not like taking content from every single person who reaches out to them. They're being selective based on what that organization can bring to their business and their brand? Will it attract viewers? And then will it help with the retention aspect of, of their subscribers? So it's not like every organization right now could reach out to Marquee TV, for example, and they'd all like, it's not that, <laughs> that quick. So this might not even really be a realistic option for a lot. And maybe in the next five to 10 years, we'll see more options and we'll see kind of like we're seeing in film and TV, we're seeing more streaming services and platforms popping up. Yeah. I mean, especially right now as the pandemic is going on and people who want to, um, you know, experience the arts, even, even from home, like, I feel like people aren't necessarily, I mean, maybe they're not getting as much of an audience as they normally would, but the people who want to will go are going to go to their website anyway to see like, oh, maybe they have some virtual content, but maybe in the post pandemic world, like 
I think it would be interesting to see how like arts streaming services could maybe expand a little bit in terms of content and like audiences because people will be like, you know, I really liked being able to watch concerts at home during the pandemic. And I want to like, you know, subscribe to this streaming service where I can see lots of different things, but also go to live things because, oh, I saw that on Marquee TV and that was really cool. So now I'm in LA, let's go to that orchestra. Yeah, I think it. the question is, will there be a market for all of this? And I, I've seen arguments going either way, either like Angela, you said, either um, people saying like now we're accustomed to consuming our what was once a live performing arts experience. We were we've accustomed to watching it from the comfort of our own homes. And now we have a preference for that. I've also seen people say that, like, we're all itching to get out and you know, we don't want to take it for granted again. So audiences are going to be swarming to theater. (laughs) That's a little melodramatic, but you know what I mean? Um, So I, I, I don't know, like you said, I think it'll be kind of a combination of it, of like, we have the option now of doing this, but yes, we will go and, you know, enjoy live experiences, but yeah. Will there be a market to support more like an influx in streaming services for performing arts content is a question I don't necessarily have the answer to. I know arts organizations would probably like that because then they'd have more opportunities to get their content on a consolidated platform. And one thing I found is like, it can be costly to produce digital content because studies have found that they're going to be much more appealing to audiences if they're specifically created for d- digital consumption as opposed to taking an archived concert. I think that's been well established <laughs> that that is not as enjoyable for audiences as something that has been created for digital consumption. So it's a shift for organizations to even produce this, both in terms of the equipment needed and then like how they're creating it at all. Um And so maybe this isn't something that some organizations want to continue to deal with. It's not within their mission. It's not within their sort of distribution plan. So when it isn't as essential, they'll. Yeah, I did want to say, I think um, once virtual is not like the only option, I think that will change. Like, I don't know, once everyone's not constantly on Zoom or you know, constantly having to stream every single thing they want to experience. I think having digital content would be like exciting and new again, um, because I feel like right now, maybe this is just me personally, but I'm like, I don't want to watch a concert online. That just makes me sad because I'm not, I can't be there. But knowing that I could be there and I'm choosing instead to watch it online, I feel like it's just like a mental shift that I think will make odd people want to do it more, but also that's not going to like stop them from going to concerts or to the theater. It's just, we like having options. We like convenience, you know? Beyond streaming, there are lots of different ways that arts organizations are adapting to COVID and allowing for more online experiences. We have virtual tours. There's lots of different ways that uh, institutions and organizations are getting creative during this time of not being in person. Um, uh, One of the things that I found that was really interesting is like a rise in uh, virtual volunteering. And I did want to talk a little bit about like the history of virtual volunteering because it's not what you think. Um, I'm so excited. So virtual volunteering is not new, though, is what I have learned. Like the first virtual volunteering was in like 1971, which is like before the Internet, which is crazy. Um, but it was with the this thing called Project Gutenberg, which uh, is a little shout out to our previous episode where we talked about public domain, because Project Gutenberg is basically like a resource that allows access to public domain works for free. And um And when they started this project back in 1971, basically people could help to transcribe stuff and send in books and eligible content. 
um, they could burn CDs and DVDs, obviously not in the 70s, but <laughs> since then. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, they could help proof proofread and everything. And that is a project that's still going on. And they add new content all the time. And it's all virtual. And it's been virtual for a really long time. And in 1997, this like initiative was launched called Virtual Volunteering Project. And that was basically just researching into the practice of virtual volunteering and um, ways that nonprofit organizations could utilize that, basically. So the point is that virtual volunteering has been going on for a very, very, very long time. It's nothing new. We're just getting a surge of it now because that's the only way that people can volunteer. And places that are doing a lot of that in cool ways are Smithsonian, specifically the Air and Space Museum, where they've got, they recently have a couple of different kinds of virtual volunteers. You can be a virtual docent, which is pretty cool. And you can also, uh, they have artifact station volunteers and talk about kind of creating digital content that's different from the in-person version. So this is an article published by the American Alliance of Museums. But here they say the article station volunteer role is notably different from that of a docent. Rather than speak for 60 or 90 minutes sharing stories and pointing out multiple features to the museum, the docents are there to answer questions in one location and then encourage visitors to move on. This shift requires docents to study up on artifacts that perhaps they hadn't covered before. So basically, the artifact station volunteers are like sharing stories and like crafting a narrative around stuff, and the docents are more answering questions and like really allowing for a personal experience, even though it's virtual. And I think that's really cool. Um, the Air and Space Museum is really neat. And this is um, specifically at their Hazi campus, which if you've never been, it is it is featured in the the classic movie, Transformers 2. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> it's like just a giant um, like airport hangar and they just have a lot of like uh, historical planes and stuff. And so that's the kind of place that when you go, it's like, it's really impactful in a way that pictures don't really work that well. So it's cool that they're able to take something that works really well in person and kind of personalize it to the virtual experience. Yeah, one thing I love is that the volunteers who are staged kind of at the entrance, I saw that they, at first, they were just kind of like hanging back and waiting for people to come to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the first things they found was that visitors didn't think the image on the monitor was real. Those volunteers now are actually really intentionally sort of greeting everyone who comes up to them and saying something specific about those those visitors. Like, I love the color of your shirt or like something very specific and personalized to them so that they feel more welcome and like they feel invited to have that interaction with them, even though it's through a screen. And I think that's really kind of funny that they had to, like, you have to convince people that it's a real person talking to you. Right. But I appreciate that they're like working really hard to like make it personal and intentional. And it sounds challenging because instead of being able to point at an object, volunteers are really being forced to use descriptive language and like you said, kind of craft a narrative around what they're doing rather than just be able to lean on the fact that they're they're present in the space and able to make more references to, to what's around them. So, but I think it's cool that that offers sort of a different, for some, maybe like a more beneficial experience for them, the type of conversations that they end up having. So I love that. I think it's worth uh, talking about the equipment required for this because it's really not super high tech for them to, at least at the Smithsonian. I think that article just mentioned that all they needed were, they used some flat screen TVs that they already had. They needed to provide computers or laptops to the actual volunteers to use in their homes. And then they needed webcams and maybe headsets. I mean, it makes sense that a place like the Air Space Museum would be, you know, innovative in their, in their use of volunteering. And I, I like the fact that they're still valuing their volunteers and saying that, you know, because it's a pandemic, I guess we just can't have volunteers. They're like, no, we're going to find a way to allow for this aspect of the museum experience. And it's not just going to be a weird, empty hall 
that you walk through by yourself with everyone else being really far away from you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, also in terms of the volunteer experience, I know that this has made the opportunity to volunteer more accessible as well, where a volunteer would typically have to spend hours on their feet in the museum. In the Smithsonian example, I think they're only their shifts are in one hour at a time and they do it from their own home. So it just becomes more possible for people who either have are, are like are working, don't have as much time to devote throughout the day to do it. So this, it could become a more, a greater possibility for, for the volunteers as well. Yeah, definitely. I think whenever we have like pandemic solutions, I feel like there's always this question of, will it continue afterwards? And the answer is obviously we, we don't know. But I think that it's an interesting thing to watch. I feel like everything pandemic related is always like, but it's more accessible. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it definitely highlights the opportunities among the challenges and sort of shortcomings. But museums have also been creative in terms of using technology and finding virtual solutions for reaching audiences. I know that towards the beginning of the pandemic last spring, almost a year ago now, a lot of museums, zoos, theme parks were offering virtual tours of their spaces. And a lot of these sort of looked like a pre-recorded like version of someone walking through a gallery space, for example, if it's a museum, which is great. And I, it seems like people took advantage of that at the time, but it isn't always the most engaging option. It's definitely cool to be able to see images, moving images of artifacts and artwork. But recently, museums in France actually hosted opportunities for visitors to view their gallery spaces over TikTok. So once again, it seems like we're going to bring up TikTok in every single Let's Talk episode. TikTok, what can't it do? <laughs> what can't it do? Um, so just a little of little bit of background about TikTok for anyone who doesn't know. It's a social media platform. It launched in 2016. It is a platform that allows users to post short videos, usually 15 seconds, or they can compile 15 second videos into like a collection totaling 60 seconds, like a minute long. And a lot of users have have used this to be really creative, use it as a means for humor. and But then also because the user base is so wide, education has also started to become a, a purpose for it. So I, I guess the, the pro of using something like TikTok over then just like a YouTube video of making it look like you're walking through a gallery is, is the engagement aspect of it. And TikTok as a form of social media really encourages interaction, liking, commenting, um, engaging with it as it's happening. So French museums signed a partnership with TikTok with the intention of widening their base among the app's users, which are historically was largely a teen audience. And so the goal was to provide sort of education opportunities for TikTok users to learn more about the artifacts or the landmarks, one of which was the Palace of Versailles. And these institutions really, they wanted to increase their audience base to encourage future visitation. This initiative, it kicked off on December 14th and it used the hashtag culture TikTok. And it was pretty successful. They streamed live shows from museums usually with a docent or a guide in front of the camera there offering some context and uh, giving sort of a a tour. Around 100,000 TikTok users around the world attended a series of dance performances. Um, This is crazy. Versailles Palace gained 10,000 followers in 30 minutes during this initiative. It makes sense. It's it's a popular place. And I feel like that one's one of those ones that's like everyone kind of just wants to go because it's pretty and like I feel like that place specifically would have an appeal to young people just because it's you know we recognize it yeah and we recognize it yeah and and a lot of the partnering organizations apparently felt that they didn't have enough followers in social media and so this was really a way to to like garner a fan base 
on social media and hoping that people turn a TikTok view into um, maybe they like your Facebook page to maybe they're on your mailing list. Not that a lot of young audiences subscribe to mailing lists, but maybe they do. I do. So uh, from what I've seen, they were pretty happy with how this went, especially because of the engagement aspect of it. And um, they're hoping to do it again. And I'd like to see this maybe be being more popular once again. We already talked about this, but post pandemic, this would be, I think, a really fun way for interested TikTok users to be able to like learn a bit about the artifacts. Maybe um, they are impassioned to pursue an interest because of what they've seen on the channel. So I do think it's funny. I was some people did think that the museum at first was fake because just just because it was on the thing and then they realized that it was like a real thing. And I just think it's funny that we, like that keeps coming up people not thinking that like this is like something you can Oh yeah, like a virtual background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll be honest when I first read the beginning of this article, I was like, this seems kind of silly. Why would you why are you trying to reach out to the TikTokers? But uh but it, the more I'm reading about about it, the more I actually think it's kind of cool. And it's nice that they're like reaching out to um, younger people kind of on their own, in their own element. Um, and one thing that I think is beneficial for this um, in terms of TikTok is that it's a really, it's a really low stakes, like low commitment kind of social media platform. Like you don't have to, um, like for instance, at the Air and Space Museum, like with the um, artifact people, that they would talk for like half an hour, 90 minutes. And that's like a long time. And most young people are just going to click away. But for if it's a TikTok video, it's what a minute tops. It's they can watch, they can look at like a museum or look at, uh, learn something about Versailles. And it's not, it's, it's not going to take up their whole day or take up too much of their attention. And if they think it's interesting, they'll look into it more, but I think it's a good entry point. Yeah. Entry point is a really good word to use here. Apparently, one of the TikTok rules is that a account cannot live stream until their follower count exceeds a thousand. Um, so that's something to keep in mind is that in order to do the live streaming aspect of it, you do need to already have a, a small um, following. An institution that's interested in doing this might have to sort of like get to that point so that they can live stream their exhibitions. And then another thing I wanted to say is that originally TikTok, like we said, was mostly for teens and young adults, but that's kind of changing a little bit. Apparently about 70% of users on TikTok in Europe are more than 25 years old. And I Honestly, would be surprised if the U.S. statistic was much different because I know, I know of people like my age who are starting to use it more just because the type of content on TikTok has like is so is broadening so much, and so if you have a particular interest, you're likely to find users who are able to like cater to that interest. Yeah, I was talking. Um... Oh yeah, this was during our la uh, the last interview <laughs> I did with uh, Rahul Lang about how just like with the advent of streaming comes a lot more like niche content and just like content these days does not need to have broad appeal. And in fact, the more specific it gets, the more the more it can appeal to people basically. And because you just have more content, I think TikTok is like the quintessential version of that because it's just like. Anything, anything that you're interested in, there is a TikTok for it, basically. A lot of it is bound to be goofy from, <laughs> from what I've experienced yeah. with it. But a lot of it is, a lot of people are using it to like genuinely and seriously convey uh, and share information. So, well, yeah, so there are a couple cool examples of how people are connecting with audiences virtually, whether it's a volunteer on a screen or the audience on a screen. <laughs> Or the museum on a screen. <laughs> Depends on your perspective. Anything can be on a screen, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and like, the key is making it engaging and accessible. Thanks for listening to the Amp Lab podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and to leave a comment. 
If you would like to learn more, go to amplab.org. That is A-M-T dash L-A-B dot org. Or you can email us at amplabcmu at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Tech in the Arts or on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn at Arts Management and Technology Lab. You can find the resources that we referenced today in the show notes. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thank you.